Thank you for joining us as we celebrate the week of Earth Day with our final session of the HHS Earth Day speaker series. We're excited you're here and for the speakers that we've already heard from and especially today's speaker in our talk today. My name is Christina Bagdikian and I'm on detail as the Outreach and Engagement Lead for the Office of Climate Change and Health Equity and I'll be moderating today's session. Before we get started, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. Uh, first, these sessions are being recorded and they'll be posted to the Office of Climate Change and Health Equity or what we call OCHI webpage. So please make sure to go to that webpage to sign up for our listserv and then you'll get a notification when the session is posted uh, for viewing later. And that they'll be posted probably in the next few days. So hang tight, um, you'll get the alert um, and you can watch. Second, we want, we want you to ask questions. Please send your questions to gogreen at hhs.gov as you think of them. You do not have to wait till the end, keep them rolling in. And at the end, our team will uh, go through them and we'll try to get to as many as possible. So again, go green at hhs.gov for your questions. All right, let's get started. Today, I'm happy to announce and welcome John Balbus. Uh, John is the interim director of the new Office of Climate Change and Health Equity within the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. John is a physician and public health professional with over 25 years of experience working on the health implications of climate change, and he served as the HHS principal to the U.S. Global Change Research Program and co-chair of the Working Group on Climate Change and Human Health for the U.S. Global Change Research Program since he joined the federal government in 2009. Before coming over to the new office, Dr. Balvis served as the Senior Advisor for Public Health to the Director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. John, I see you're up, and when you're ready, take it away. Great. Well, thank you so much, Christina, for, for that wonderful introduction and for helping to organize this Earth Day Speaker Series. It's really a, a humbling honor to, to be the third speaker today, and um, I'm very grateful to, to the Go Green, Get Healthy program team within the Program Support Center and HHS Communications and the HHS Studio for being able to, to beam us live today. Uh, especially grateful to all of you who have joined to, to help us celebrate Earth Day by, by talking about the issues of climate change and health equity. And um, I'm very happy to, to share with you um, some thoughts about uh, and some information about how climate change impacts health and especially how it impacts our efforts to achieve health equity within the Department of Health and Human Services uh, and what HHS is doing about it to try to, to, to mobilize and to make achieving health equity in the face of climate change a core part of the HHS mission. So um, I'm going to start with three themes and I'll just advance here. And my, there we go. Um, these are three headlines that, that kind of illustrate three of the themes I, I want to emphasize today. The top left is a headline noting that 200 of the most important medical journals in the world got together, something they don't do very often at all, let alone for a topic like climate change, to highlight the, the, the threat to global public health that climate change poses and, and labeling it the greatest threat to public health of the 21st century. So this is both an indication of the urgency with which we must act, but it's also an indication of how climate change is becoming a mainstream health issue when we have that number of mainstream medical journals taking this up as the most important issue they have to deal with. At the top right is a headline from one of what are actually many studies that show that uh, the, the burden that we face now, um, and it's a burden that contributes to health disparities, I would add, from environmental exposures, especially from particulate matter air pollution, um, is, is creating a, a large burden of ill health and actually a large burden of economic drain on our economy to the tune of $2,500 a year in economic costs from air pollution alone. 
a lot of this air pollution is coming from the same sources that are contributing to the climate change problem, which is the greatest threat to global public health. And so I want to make that link that the actions that we take to address climate change as a nation have enormous health implications, mainstream health implications for health equity. And then on the bottom is the headline from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in their most recent assessment report, which in many cases uh, painted a dire picture. Uh, if you've heard the headline, if you've looked at some of the summary findings. Um, and so I, I include this um, in part to convey the sense of urgency. And as that report painted a dire picture of what is already happening and what is in some cases unavoidable with the amount of um, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere already, it also made the very strong case that urgent action taken now can make a huge difference in the outcome. And that means health outcomes for people around the world. And so there's an urgency, there is a, a, an opportunity for action. And I include this also because when we read reports like this, I just want to emphasize these are disheartening. These are themselves sources of, of mental anguish for those who read them and consider the implications carefully. Uh, and so the, the, the call to action and the mobilization to action is one of the most important things that we can do to keep hope and to be able to address the problem in an effective way. And these are just some examples of the health impacts and the types of exposures that are associated with climate change that are already happening. I know um, Tom DiLiberto yesterday in his wonderful presentation uh, talked about the heat dome event that happened last summer in the Northwest and just noted that, that this um, widespread record shattering heat was in many ways unprecedented and, and scientific studies have shown that it was entirely attributable to the amount of climate change that we're already experiencing. And of course, we lost hundreds of people uh, many of them, uh, people who are experiencing health disparities already in this heat wave. Um, and this is one of the motivating factors for the actions that you'll be seeing uh, a little bit later in the presentation. The slide on the right is, is from a study uh, that NPR published that looked at the increase in wildfire smoke exposure. And most of you are familiar with, with the increase in wildfires that we've had in the West in the past couple of years. What's most notable to me about this picture, we think about wildfires and, and we think about the, the mountains of California and, and Oregon, and, and we think about, to some extent, the Rockies. Uh, and you can see some increases in exposure there from the increase in fires. But the, the, the biggest burden of exposure happened in the middle of the country, downwind from, from where the fires occurred themselves, as well as all the way into the southeast. So it's a national issue, everybody's affected, and we know that the things like wildfire smoke bumping up the levels of particulate matter in our, in our air um, has enormous implications for health, not just because it worsens cardiovascular disease, not just because it worsens respiratory diseases like asthma, but as we saw, pollution, air pollution exposure was a huge cofactor in causing COVID-19 mortality. So, so the, the very same things that we are addressing as we are continuing to grapple with the COVID-19 pandemic are interlaced with the things that we have to be addressing now and in the future because of climate change. And this is just a, another illustration of this. It's, it's um, we have to be caring for our vulnerable populations in, in the face of the COVID pandemic this is incredibly important work. It's still ongoing. We have to be addressing not just the access to care, the access to vaccines, but also the social isolation, especially in our elderly populations that happen. But what, what I'm showing with this picture is that we have to address this in a bigger context, recognizing that uh, climate related weather disasters are going to interfere with our, our operations, interfere with access to care, interfere with people's mobility, interfere with the ability of senior centers and other um, facilities to stay open. And so if we're gonna be successful in caring for the next pandemic and just addressing you know, the existing health problems that we face as a nation, 
we have to be looking to the, the resilience of our health systems to continue operations in the face of threats like this. Um, and it's not just, just fires. I know, again, that, that, that Tom Villaverto shared uh, a lot of information about, about the NOAA's Billion Dollar Disasters Project, just to show that it, these are, are events that are happening all around the country. Um, it's not just um, fires, it's also the hurricanes in the Gulf Coast that had a lot of disrupting effects on, on healthcare services and the severe storms. And even, as Tom pointed out, um, anomalous events like the, the, the uh, freeze that happened in Texas last year are related to, to the disruption of our climate systems, that the cold air that plunged from, from the, the poles down into Texas was plunging from the poles because there was warmer air displacing it. So this is a slide that many of you have seen, and um, I, I'm sharing it. It comes from colleagues at the, at the Climate and Health Program at CDC. It remains one of, one of the, the best graphic depictions of how climate change impacts health and what those health impacts are. And you know, the first thing you see, yes, it's colorful, but it's also got a lot of text on it around the outside. And that outer layer are all the different um, health manifestations of climate change. And you can see from that, that the outer ring that it, it, um, it, it, it comprises both short-term health impacts like injuries or heart attacks in the face of extreme heat or severe weather events or, or air pollution events. But it also contains some, some more slow-moving and, and chronic kinds of processes like the changes that we've seen, and, and I think Tom showed a slide of this, um, about the migration of Lyme disease northward as the, the tick vectors are able to survive winters that are warmer. Um, it's the changes we've seen in mosquito ecology and expansion of mosquito habitat um, up from the south of, of 80s mosquitoes that carry diseases like West Nile and chikungunya. Um, so there's slow moving um, uh, impacts of climate change. Similarly, in that um, bottom right, the, there are changes in, in pollen seasons and the timing of pollen seasons, even in the quality of pollen in the face of carbon dioxide um, that affect people's um, respiratory allergies and asthma. Uh, and then in the bottom left is a real important aspect that we have to think about as we think about health and human services, which is um, the slow and progressive changes in our ecosystems that actually address the fundamental supports of life. Things like the erosion of the coastal communities in Northwest Alaska, or the melting of the permafrost, which, are, are lead, which is leading to both problems with food storage, but, but even to transportation and injuries from sm snowmobile accidents because there are holes forming in the permafrost. It deals with things like the loss of, of glacial ice uh, in, in a lot of the Pacific coastal areas where communities may be dependent on, on, on the snowpack. Even much of California is facing this um, with, with prolonged drought and, and loss of the snowpack to be able to supply essential water. And then it also is related to the loss of low-lying coastal areas or low-lying islands. And this is something that's already happening. There's already displacement and forced migration because of inundation of low-lying areas and, 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 um, and Pacific islands that creates tremendous um, stresses on the individuals, on the communities that are forced to relocate, and also on the health systems that are receiving them. So again, a wide range of, of different kinds of health impacts that our health systems have to deal with. And in that inner ring, a lot of different kinds of exposures and threats um, related to, to our weather, to, to the air quality, to the natural ecosystems that sustain and support life, uh, including um, the, just the very land that we live on. I want to take a moment and just um, go through uh, definitions. And I know that Tom and, and, and also Sankita Kadam, who, who, who gave a wonderful presentation two days ago from NASA, talked about these same concepts. But I just want to make sure that I clarify for this audience what we mean by these terms, because all of these terms have multiple meanings in different settings. And when, in, the, in the climate change world, and in the climate change and health world, um, some of them have more specific meanings. 
So the first term is vulnerability, and I, I just want to say straight out, this is not about weakness. Uh, we use a definition of vulnerability as, as a state of being placed at higher risk of harm by higher and sometimes disproportionate exposure, by greater sensitivity given in a certain amount of exposure, and or reduced ability to adapt or to escape from harm. So this is not a characteristic of the vulnerable community or, or population. It's often a characteristic of, of the, the context uh, in which they live, which is often a context of discrimination or injustice. The second term is mitigation. And mitigation means a lot of things. I think you heard um, from Tom that mitigation in a climate change context refers fairly specifically to the reduction of in, in risks from climate change by reducing the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, either by emitting less or by removing them from the atmosphere. So we talk about risk mitigation. That's a different meaning. This is climate mitigation. It's about reducing greenhouse gases and reducing the threat of climate change. Um, adaptation uh, is a word that comes to us from, you know, from evolution. Uh, in this sense, we think of it in, as an adjustment in human or natural systems in response to a newer changing environment that can exploit beneficial opportunities or moderate negative consequences. And resilience is a, a very closely related term to adaptation in a climate context. Adaptation is that process of adjustment. Resilience is more a characteristic of a system or an institution or a person or a community. Um, and it means the ability to anticipate or prepare for, respond to, and recover from threats with minimal damage to health, well-being, economy, and the environment. So I just want to make sure that we have common understanding of what those words mean when we use them. With that as definition, um, this is a, a diagram that appeared first in the 2016 Climate and Health Assessment that we published with the Global Change Research Program. And it's an important diagram for an HHS Health and Human, Service, and Human Services um, audience because it, it talks about the interactions between the social determinants of health, which are in those light blue boxes in the left, and the elements that put people at higher risk, that put them in that vulnerability, that state of higher risk from climate change. So uh, in the climate change world, we divide that vulnerability into these three categories, exposure, sensitivity, given a certain amount of exposure, and adaptive capacity. And exposure is often a result of poverty and being poor, um, having few options as to where you live or even experiencing homelessness, um, the kind of occupation that you have that may put you uh, in an outdoor setting or otherwise exposed to climate change risks, and frank, uh, outright racial discrimination in terms of, of housing and in, uh, investment in, in neighborhoods. We'll talk about that in a little bit. In terms of sensitivity, that often has to do with having an underlying condition. Of course, we saw that with COVID, that people with obesity, with um, underlying cardiovascular respiratory disease had a greater risk. It's exactly the same for climate change. When people are exposed to heat or disasters, if they have underlying um, at, uh, asthma, respiratory uh, disease, cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, also anxiety, depression, and other kinds of mental and behavioral health disorders, they're at greater risk of bad outcomes. And then lastly, uh, that area of adaptive capacity, the ability to protect yourself or escape harm is associated with many of the, the, the social determinants of health, uh, which are associated with poverty, housing, et cetera. And again, I just wanted to drive home a point that the kind of things we talk about for health equity and climate change are the exact same things we talk about for health equity and the current pandemic. And this is just a graphic I borrowed from the Health Equity Initiative that talked about how bad outcomes and inequitable outcomes from COVID-19 are associated with upstream factors from discriminatory policies, limited access, the history of racism and social discrimination, poverty, overcrowded or poor quality living conditions, chronic stress, low health um, or climate and health literacy, and um, deliberate misinformation about climate change, just as there is with COVID, and general mistrust of government um, institutions. 
And I also just want to emphasize that when we talk about the health impacts of climate change, there is a growing recognition and, and, and we need to be thinking about the, the, the mental health implications, especially in the face of the epidemic we have of, of uh, mental behavioral substance abuse disorders in young people, young adults. And I, I just want to credit the Surgeon General's office in their, in their report on, on the determinants of, uh, of or the, uh, about the, the current mental health crisis uh, in young people, they, they pointed to the importance of environmental factors. Uh, they identified climate change very specifically, but also those social determinants of health that are related to the natural and built environment, like access to green space, like access to healthy food, like adequate housing, access to health care, you know, clean air, clean water, et cetera. Uh, and then, very importantly, put that in the context of the broader, society, broader upstream societal factors like discrimination, racism, migration, forced migration, uh, the, the, the media and technology, et cetera. That, uh, but those, those first, uh, you know, the, the economics, the discrimination that are upstream drivers of the environmental factors. So just to, to, to show how this looks from a, a visual standpoint in a real place, I just want to share a series of maps. Um, many of you have seen these maps that look at the, um, the, the, the uh, municipal area maps from the Homeowners Loan Corporation. These were created in the 1930s uh, as a way in a partnership with the federal government to um, provide a service at that time, uh, I, you know, and I say service with, with great uh, uh, qualification, to the nation's financial institutions to grade neighborhoods on perceived financial risk um, so that the banks could have that information as they made decisions about loans and other kinds of investments. So they used a four color code, green to blue to yellow to red, for increasing levels of financial risk, green being the lowest, red being the highest. And for those of you who have seen this already, you know uh, the outcome. The green areas were disproportionately white areas. The red areas were disproportionately areas where people of color lived, African-Americans, other immigrants, uh, people of Hispanic origin. Um, the important story here is, is that these decisions, these um, designations, these zones that were created of high, you know, perceived high risk, perceived low risk in the 1930s played out over the ensuing 80 years uh, at, to, to be huge determinants of people's health. And so the areas that are red have much higher proportions of everything from preterm births to asthma to mental health disorders uh, compared to the green areas. This is exactly the same for climate change related factors. So this is a map, one of the first maps done uh, of the city of Richmond. You can see the green areas to, to the northwest and in the left side, the red areas on the right side. And this is a series of maps provided by the New York Times that shows how 80 years later, those red line neighborhoods had many factors that contributed to dis disparate um, exposures to climate related threats. So this is a map of tree cover, and we know that tree cover is important for both shading and, and, and reducing urban heat islands. It's important for air quality. Um, and you can see the, the green zones are indeed green here in terms of tree cover. The red line neighborhoods have much less tree cover. This is a map of impervious surface. And again, impervious surface shows this pavement. It traps heat. It also um, contributes to uh, uh, over, overflowing of, of stormwater systems and flooding. And you can see again, and of course it goes with tree cover, if you plant a tree, that's going to be less impervious surface. Uh, it's it's um, less impervious surface in the richer uh, green zones, more impervious surface in the red line neighborhoods. And these two things translate into directly into heat exposure. So this is a heat map of the heat, urban heat islands, and you can see the blue temperatures are lower in the green zone areas, the red temperatures are higher, in the red line neighborhoods. So again, just a, a, a visual depiction of how, how important places in terms of all of the social determinants of health as we know, but also in terms of people's exposure to heat, to flooding, and to transportation, especially related air pollution. 
Um, it's not just those factors. This is a, a red line map of the city of New Orleans showing um, on the left the, the red, li red lined areas uh, in the downtown area, the French Quarter, a few green zones up in the northern area. And when Katrina struck, um, this is just one visual depiction of, of how um, labeling neighborhoods as being poor financial risks is uh, associated with areas that were at greatest vulnerability when the levees broke. And of course, there was devastating consequences for the people that lived there that are, are still ongoing 15 years later. Uh, it's not just um, heat and floods uh, that, that, that contribute to disparate exposures. These are, are pictures showing how climate-related threats, flooding from hurricanes uh, Florence and Superstorm Sandy, contributed to people's exposures to, to harmful chemicals. Uh, on the left is a picture from North Carolina of you know, one, of the, one of the homes of in, the environmental justice movement surrounding the, the industrial agricultural facilities. And this is just showing how when the floods hit, those neighborhoods closest to those facilities become uh, inundated with, with uh, water containing toxic runoff uh, from, from, from the, the sewage and the wastes of those industrial farms. And on the right is an image um, from northern New Jersey, but when, when Superstorm Sandy struck, many environmental justice neighborhoods were exposed to legacy uh, and recent chemical pollutants from industrial facilities that were located in the waterfronts, and the floods drove uh, water from you know, Superfund sites and, and ongoing industrial waste facilities uh, up into the neighborhoods. And then lastly, this is just the same concept showing that uh, air quality is also closely associated with this air, uh, historical redlining practice. This was a study done of 202 different areas from maps drawn in the 30s and 80, 80 years later, 75 years later, there's a linear correlation between the risk given of financial risk and the people's exposure to nitrogen oxides which is a, primarily a transportation-related air pollutant. So I hope I've made that case uh, abundantly clear. Um, and I want to come back. I, when I started, I said that, that this exposure to air pollution from fossil fuels is both an ongoing cause of health disparities that we have to be addressing, but also this incredible opportunity to link to climate mitigation and the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions that are also associated with emissions of particulate matter air pollution. That's just one of many different potential health benefits. This is a big, busy slide. I'm sorry, I keep looking for a really nice, clear graphic, but kind of like the kaleidoscope slide we started with, I think one point that can be taken from it is that there are many different types of health benefits from mental health, less cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, better nutrition, lower rates of obesity, lower rates of cancer. So a wide range of health benefits that come from a wide range of pathways, everything from reducing the burning of fossil fuels to the, the creation of bioswales and nature-based solutions to flooding, to heat islands that have all of these additional benefits for people's health. So um, in the last 10 minutes, I'm going to cover um, what's going on in HHS. It may be more like 15 minutes. Um, HHS has been working on climate change and health for many, many years. Um, my home institution, the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, uh, has, has been the designated uh, representative to the Global Change Research Program since the Global Change Research Act was, was written and passed in 1990. Uh, and so um, before this year, a lot of that work, though, was, was um, in small parts of HHS. So we've had the CDC Climate and Health Program within the National Center for Environmental Health. Um, that has been really the sole um, congressionally appropriated program within HHS working on climate change and health uh, and has continued uh, in, 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 a, in a very vital role supporting state and city um, health departments in um, adapt, in, in vulnerability assessment and adaptation planning for climate change since 2000, I think 2009. Um, and other parts of CDC have, have been partnering, but, but not all of CDC, we'll put it that way. Um, the NIEHS Climate Change and Health Program uh, has both been um, 
the, the funding the majority of grants within NIH on climate change and health for the past 15 years, but also um, doing other projects uh, in association with the Global Change Research Program, creating resources like the, the literature portal, et cetera. Uh, and again, parts of NIH have also funded uh, grants that were primarily investigator initiated. But aside from the CDC and NIH, there really has been very little dedicated activity on climate change and health across HHS. There's always the emergency response to climate-related disasters and the activities to um, protect health systems and populations in the face of weather disasters, um, but that's been done without a clear linkage to, to future modeling and, and the, the kind of forward-looking lens that climate change gives to that. And in general, um, relatively limited investment in healthcare sector resilience and, and no investment at all in, in the climate mitigation side to, uh, to work on emissions reduction. So a lot of opportunity to, 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 uh, to expand this and to, to make it mainstream in the HHS mission. I started with the urgency and our vision is that uh, we urgently get to work on this and that by 2025, we have all health facilities um, fully prepared for long-term operation that we have bolstered the health resilience of, of all communities, all health systems, and, and also the workforce, the providers, uh, to, to understand and to start to prepare for both the disasters and the big disruptive events, but also those chronic, slow-moving climate impacts. And that lastly, the entire health sector in the United States, but especially the health systems, are publicly tracking greenhouse gas emissions and on a path to net zero by tackling, and this is climate change parlance, so there's three scopes of, of, of greenhouse gas emissions. Scope one is what comes directly out of this, the stacks of your facilities or the vented the vents. Um, so for a health uh, facility, it would be their burner or it might be the escape of anesthetic gases. For scope two, that's a indirect uh, emissions associated with the energy supply. So um, hospitals, especially big tertiary hospitals are big consumers of electricity. So scope two is important for them. But scope three is associated with the supply chain and all the other indirect emissions, like the emissions of patients from their cars as they drive to their appointments, et cetera, uh, the workforce driving to work. Um, scope three is the, the bulk of the health sector emissions, and so um, we're working on all three of those scopes. So in that context comes, comes the new Office of Climate Change and Health Equity, which, which I've had the honor of helping to start up and direct. This is a, a mandate from Executive Order 1408, tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad, and is one of three mandates given to HHS directly uh, in this executive order on climate change, the other two being to start up an interagency working group to decrease health risks of climate change to vulnerable populations and a biennial healthcare system readiness advisory council. Um, our office sits right here uh, in the org chart, aside a uh, wonderful sister um, offices, including the Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion, working on, on uh, a lot of social determinants of health, uh, the Office of Minority Health, uh, a major home for health equity, population affairs, research integrity, women's health, uh, with all of the special um, issues related to maternal child health and, and women's health associated with climate change. So we're um, in a great location within HHS. And from that location, this is the kind of work that our office is taking on. These are the elements of, of, of our agenda. Um, the first four elements have to do with identifying communities with disproportionate exposure, so, so, so building up the data systems and the evidence base for finding the communities to prioritize. Um, this work on addressing the fundamental health disparities associated with um, the social determinants of health that are exacerbated by climate impacts, and alternatively, can be improved by uh, multi-sectoral climate actions in that next bullet um, that we talked about through uh, you know, both changes in energy systems, but also non-motorized transportation, green space, um, reducing impervious surface, et cetera. And then directly working with the healthcare sector on their greenhouse gas emission reductions. So those are, that's kind of a lot of the what's, some of the how's. We're working on um, building training opportunities to, to create um, leaders in the field of climate change and health equity support community resilience and health system resilience, fostering innovation, working um, with the other agencies and the White House uh, to help in coordination and subject matter expertise on this topic, 
and also working in, in close public-private partnerships to, to work with the private and philanthropic sectors. We, um, in this year, are, are working under not just the, the, the mandate from Executive Order 14008, but other mandates and commitments we've undertaken. Shortly after launching, um, Ad, the Assistant Secretary for Health, Admiral Levine, led the first ever official HHS delegation to a major international climate change meeting, the, the Conference of Parties, or COP26, under the UN framework. And this is a picture of, of Admiral Levine making commitments to resilient and low carbon health systems uh, on behalf of, of, of HHS in the United States. We have commitments under the Climate Adaptation Resilience Plan I'll talk about, as well as Objective 2.4 in the HHS Strategic Plan. Um, the Climate Adaptation Resilience Plan that, that we um, uh, partnered with, with the, uh, the Program Support Center and, and ASA and the Chief Sustainability Office of, of HSA, HHS to, to develop um, last summer has five major priority actions. Um, the first being to, to build on that existing climate change work at CDC and NIH. Um, but the second is, is all the other divisions, and, and I highlight that because that's what our office has been focusing on um, since our, our establishment. We're also partnering to work on climate resilient grant policies, partnering with, with ASA, working on work, uh, workplace optimization, space, transportation, tra you know, transit management, and uh, sustainable and climate resilient operations at, at our facilities. And also very important, um, what our talk today is part of is, is the training and building HHS climate literacy. This is something that um, the administration emphasized in all the agency climate action plans and, and our office is working on that. Um, I, I'm sharing a screenshot from the new HHS strategic plan. We, we have an explicit objective um, within the, the general objective about protecting uh, the health of the American people in the face of, of emerging threats and disasters, et cetera, to mitigate the impacts of environmental factors, including climate change on health outcomes. And, and our office is, is um, looking to play a, a supportive and coordinating role, as well as a direct role in achieving this objective with the other divisions. So this is how we divide our work. Um, hopefully this, this is almost second nature now from the way I've been talking about things. Our first priority is that primary mandate to, to, to reduce the risk of climate change, the health risks of climate change to all Americans, but especially those most vulnerable. The second priority is to team up with the work on social determinants of health, to team up with the infrastructure uh, investments that are being made to try to harness them to address those fundamental health disparities that not only contribute to people's vulnerability to climate change impacts, so it's important for achieving that primary goal, but it's just good in and of itself to reduce those health disparities because of the injustice, because of the vulnerability to the next pandemic or the current pandemic. It's just a major priority for us. And then the third area is working directly with the health sector on health system resilience and decarbonization. And underlying all of this is, is functions that we have within our office for data and analytics and indicators communications and outreach, and I mentioned the training and literacy uh, activities we have. And this is just a, a depiction of how we see ourselves. We, we, uh, we hope to be a hub um, connecting communities, the other HHS operating, and of course staff divisions, the other um, departments uh, of, of the federal agency working on climate change and, and community resilience. Very specifically, we're working with the other federal agencies that manage um, significant health systems, like the Veterans Health Administration, the Department of Defense, the Indian Health Service within HHS, to help achieve a, a second executive order on, on achieving sustainability and, and, and achieving uh, climate change mitigation targets within the federal government. We are helping to create a learning network in order to facilitate the decarbonization of those health systems within the federal system. And then on the bottom left, we're partnering with the National Academy of Medicine through a new action collaborative that is called the Action Collaborative on Decarbonizing the Health Sector, which um, Admiral Levine co-chairs, in order to help to move and facilitate that action on the part of the private sector as well. 
These are some of our accomplishments to date. Um, we have um, been a, an important part of co-chairing an, uh, an interagency working group to, to address the threats of extreme heat to the American people and to take an all of government approach to that. Uh, I've mentioned the, uh, the National Academy Action Collaborative, the commitments. Um, we have been, um, these are HHS accomplishments, uh, some of which we have, have been playing a supportive role. And um, one of the exciting developments has been the, the inclusion of questions about climate change and equity in requests for information um, from the, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. The first one came out in December of 2021 in the notice of proposed rulemaking for, for the marketplaces and, and the payers. Um, mentioned the learning network. We um, have sat down with, with all of the op operating divisions and staff divisions that, uh, like, like the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response that work directly um, with, with populations to, to start to develop that all of HHS adaptation plan. Uh, and one of the manifestations of that was the first ever convening of representatives from all the divisions of HHS in a climate change and health equity working group. And that's, that's where we've been, where we're going. Uh, we're, we're, uh, we've, we're producing, and I have quotes around package. I, I hate quotes, but sometimes you can't be explicit about everything that's coming out that isn't out yet. But we have a whole set of new and integrated information resources. One of the things that we've been working on for a while and we're excited about is, is the prospect of providing uh, periodic forecasts for weather-related, climate-related health impacts that would build on the monthly NOAA seasonal forecasts that come out that say, you know, where's it going to be hot? Where's it going to rain more? We are looking to, to create a product that will help interpret that for the health sector in terms of what does that mean for health? Where are the heat waves going to be? Where is drought going to be a problem, et cetera? Uh, we are um, working to, to develop the, the possibility of, of a, a, a pledge event where health private sector and administration um, health sector uh, managers would pledge to, to the resilience and the decarbonization of health systems. Um, we are looking to update the programmatic component, that priority two of the HHS Climate Adaptation and Resilience Plan um, on a path to creating first an HHS-wide, but ultimately a government-wide national adaptation plan for health, which is one of the things that we committed to under that COP26 commitment. Um, a key part of that is, is, is also doing an adaptation gap analysis, and we have a, a project that we're, we're starting up in partnership with, with our HHS regional offices uh, and uh, to, to, to do some deep dives and, and start to really codify, capture, and integrate uh, the learnings that have already been brought to us, but also additional insights into where are the gaps between federal resources and the necessary resources to, to protect people in the face of climate change threats, especially the, the, the most vulnerable, especially people who are um, marginalized, who are mistrustful of the government systems. You know, how, how do we close that gap so that we're protecting everybody uh, to the extent that they need. And then lastly, um, we're working to, to, be, to be developing a set of technical assistance and supports in partnership with multiple operating divisions, everything from updating our, our Sustainable Climate Resilient Healthcare Facilities Toolkit, which we developed um, eight years ago, uh, and, and that the, the ASPR uh, Critical Infrastructure Program is, is updating tools of their own to producing new guidance on decarbonization of, of healthcare facilities. Um, so hot off the presses to close are, are, are some, some very recent um, activities. I mentioned the importance of signaling to the health sector of, of the United States, and of course the United States is the biggest health system, health sector in the world, uh, that climate change is becoming part of, of, of mainstream interest for the Department of Health and Human Services, and one of the best ways to signal that is through these notices of proposed rulemaking. So um, just this week, the, the, uh, the notice of proposed rulemaking for the inpatient prospective payment services, the IPPS for acute and long-term care hospitals was published. And these are just some outtakes. They, they said explicitly seeking stakeholder input on what HHS and CMS can do 
uh, to support the health system to determine impacts, to understand those exceptional threats the climate-related emergencies pose, and under to understand how to take action on reducing emissions and tracking progress. And then um, last thing I'm going to show is, is another um, uh, re, uh, about to be uh, fully released uh, uh, report. This is an analysis that, that demonstrates the power of, of the data that, that HHS has to really identify the hot spots, the problem spots for climate related health threats. Um, this is a, a map showing the areas that have had the greatest heat. This is um, not heat, I'm oh, no, sorry, this is not health data, this is, this is historic heat data. And I just want to focus in here on two representative counties down there in southwest Arizona is La Paz County, which has uh, a, 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 a lot of poverty, high proportion of mobile homes, inadequate tree cover, high rates of health problems uh, in, in, a, um, you know, in, in, in the southwest. And Pike County, which is a highly rural county, also has high rates of diabetes, high poverty, um, a high rate of, of residents working in, in an outdoor setting. Uh, and this is a map showing a new use of AHRQ data um, using the HCUP uh, data set, um, analyzing where are the counties that have had the highest per capita rates of, um, of uh, emergency department visits directly related to heat exposure. Uh, and you can see that, that in general, that, that core of the country in the Midwest is, is among the highest areas. And those two counties that we pointed out, um, Pike County, La Paz County, have very high rates. They're up in the top quartile of emergency room visits for heat stress. So for the health systems, for the health departments there, understanding both that this is a, 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 a recurrent problem and additional resources need to go into the prevention side, but what that prevention might look like. What are the characteristics of vulnerability? We talked about high rate of mobile homes in La Paz County. We talked about um, the high rate of outdoor workers in Pike County. Being able to combine these sources of information, the census data, the heat information, and the health data is one of the key ways that HHS can mainstream health resilience, even as we're looking at all those other ways to reduce those health disparities in those counties. So uh, in closing, I, I hope I've uh, been able to convince you that climate change is a mainstream issue for HHS because it compounds and it interacts with all of the social determinants of health, with all the existing stressors that we are addressing so assiduously so determinedly to reduce health disparities and to achieve health equity. That the climate change impacts and really importantly, the solution space that we need to be urgently creating touch directly on the HHS missions because there are enormous health implications of both adaptation and especially those mitigation solutions. And that HHS has opportunities all across the divisions, throughout the human services, throughout the health services to be a major contributor. So with that, I'll close. I have talked through some of the time I hope to save for questions, but I look forward to, to hearing um, the questions now and um, at this email address if anybody wants to send them afterwards. So back to you, Christina. Thank you so much, John. Um, I'll let folks know that um, please send your email, your questions into gogreen at hhs.gov. And then if we run out of time, you can still send them there or to the OT at hhs.gov, either way. Um, for, but for now, go green at hhs.gov. Um, John, are you ready for some questions? We have a few in the queue already. Absolutely. All right. Um, the first question is, how is HHS working with other agencies to address the climate crisis? So, um, HHS participates in, in a number of different interagency working groups. Some of them have been around for a long time, like the Global Change Research Program, which creates a lot of the information supports and the assessments and the data sets. And, you know, as I mentioned, NIEHS has, has played a big role in that. CDC co-chairs a working group um, that, that has done a lot of that work. But then there's also the new interagency working groups, like the HEAT interagency working group that we've just stood up. You know, I, I guess what I'd say right now um, our office 
um, the, the dedicated staff on climate and health in NIH and CDC, and an increasing number of staff across the divisions are just engaging through the White House, through, uh, through these interagency working groups uh, to, 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 to bring health um, you know, to, to those discussions. Um, I'll just say, all, we need more help. It's a big battle. It happens all the time. The climate change world recognizes that health is really important, but it's hard for them sometimes to recognize exactly how health professionals, health systems, human services can be part of their solutions. So um, it's an important area. And happy for the question and, and happy to have more discussion of that. Thanks, John. It's a big question, um, but HHS is a key player in making sure health is protected from climate change. Thank you. Um, another question we got is, uh, you mentioned that HHS has invested a lot in addressing, climate, uh, addressing disasters after they happen, but not necessarily in preventing or mitigating disasters before they happen. Does HHS have the power on its own to reduce GHG emissions on a scale that can reduce climate change? If so, how? Okay, so I'm hearing two questions in there, and they're both really important. Um, you know, the first is um, the, the need for, for all of society um, to break out of the, you know, disaster, suffer, uh, emergency, respond, you know, recover as best as possible, and then the next disaster hits cycle and to really work at that other um, use of the word mitigation that FEMA uses, which is risk mitigation or disaster risk reduction. So, um, you know, HHS doesn't have the lead on this. FEMA actually has, uh, you know, major investments through their BRIC program. Uh, a lot of the other agencies are starting to invest more and more and more in resilience and disaster risk reduction. So that's a huge paradigm shift that we need to bring where we you know, embed our, 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 our disaster response into a bigger picture of climate change adaptation because we know that a lot of the, the amount of energy in the natural system is growing because of the trapping of heat. And so all of these disasters are getting, uh, you, know, you know, whether it's the amount of rainfall, the wind speed uh, of tornadoes, all of these things are getting more intense. We need to be thinking ahead for those. The second question there, um, Christina, was does HHS have the ability to solve uh, the climate crisis all by itself? And the answer there is, of course, no. But very importantly, the health sector is a major contributor to the U.S., especially greenhouse gas um, uh, uh, pro you know, uh, profile. It's estimated that the health sector is about 8.5% of the nation's total. That's about twice the size of the average global um, con contribution of a health system. So I think that HHS and, and the U.S. health system has a very important role to play. Part of it is symbolic. Um, HH, uh, health professionals are trusted messengers, as Tom Gilberto said yesterday. Health professionals have been slow to the game to start saying that they think that it's an important thing for them to do. So just getting hospitals on board is important symbolically, but it's also important quantitatively because we are that you know, nearly 10% of the entire greenhouse gas profile for the country. Thank you, John. That was a, that was a good question, and um, I'm impressed you remember the two part the two parts of it. Um, I'm going to add one more thing, though. Sorry, Christina, to sure. interrupt you. But the the real important thing that HHS can say is that first point that I was making that if everybody else reduces, especially the fossil fuel combustion part of greenhouse gases, the health benefits that come immediately from that are enormous. And so enormous, in fact, and I, you know, I, I could have talked for four hours, but I didn't put this in. There are many studies that document that the economic value of just the air pollution benefits of stopping fossil fuel combustion pay for the greenhouse gas mitigation by themselves. That's a point that just nobody really, you know, that should be a, that, that's a, to me, that's a kind of a boom, kind of mind-blowing uh, fact that those studies show that. Um, I think that the health professionals have a really important role in, in letting people know and having those discussions about how good it is for health 
to achieve those kind of greenhouse gas reductions. Sorry, back to you. No, that's great. Thank you, John. Um, all right, it looks like we got a question from somebody on the inside of HHS based on the way they phrased the question. So I'm gonna try to um, translate for folks who are not inside the department. Um, could John speak further on how optives and staffives, so different parts of HHS um, that have historically been less involved in climate related work can get more connected to the interagency climate work that has been initiated and more specifically, what kind of technical assistance and support is your office, the Office of Climate Change and Health Equity, providing to HHS um, departments optives? So I'll, I guess I'll answer the first question in the context of the second question. Certainly, you know, we are not the police, right? Anybody in any agency, any part of the Department of Hum Health and Human Services can find their way to any interagency working group that they would like. Um, and we don't control that. Um, but we are trying to be a hub. We do have a lot of knowledge of what's going on in the climate and, 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 and health space in the interagency working group space. So we're very happy to facilitate those connections and to, to, to introduce people to that. Um, in terms of technical assistance and support, our, our office is of course small. We, we have less than, less, you know, about half a dozen people right now. And so we have fewer people than there are operating divisions um, within HHS and each operating division, the major operating divisions, you know, have, have probably 30 different branches that, that would be relevant. So we're sitting down one by one with everybody we can. Um, the assistant secretary and secretary have designated primary points of contact for all of the divisions. And those are the people who are the primary members of that climate change and health equity working group we have just started convening. So that's a primary way in which we come together, we identify needs for support and technical assistance, and our office is dedicating to provide that to the full extent we can. Um, the rest of it is, is really opportunistic. We are few, and so the conversations we have, the opportunities we have, we're sitting down with HRSA, uh, Health Resources Services Administration, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, we're working very closely with the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response Office, very closely with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, very closely with Administration for Children and Families and Administration for Community Living. All of those divisions have tremendous assets uh, and, 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 and a stake in these issues. And so um, it's just happening as much as and as quickly as it can. And it hap you know, if there's anything specific there, there's the big email address. We'll, we'll take it up right away. Thank you, John. Um, I'm going to try to sneak in one quick question. It's a big question, but I think you can answer it pretty simply. Um, where can people go for information to tailor solutions to specific community needs? What's a good resource for folks to go to? Well, that I wish it was that easy a question, and and I think you know I that it's, it is, it's not possible to answer that in, in, in the 30 seconds. Um, I would say, first of all, keep an eye on our website. We are putting together resources that, that integrate that kind of information. But you know, every community is very, very specific. And our process over the next year or two is going to be to, to understand the heterogeneity, the breadth, the different kinds of pinch points and problems that communities are having in, you know, in, in achieving protection and resilience. Uh, and we hope to build out better and better resources. There's a lot of activity in this space. There is not an easy one-stop shop, but happy to entertain questions and to point people to specific kinds of resources. Thank you, John. That was a hard one to end on. Um, I'll, I'll say one thing. There is the, 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 the uh, Climate Resilience Toolkit. Uh, and I don't, toolkit.gov, toolkit.climate.gov, I think is the URL. That, that is a good starting place. Excellent. Thank you for sneaking that last part in there. John, thanks for spending the last hour uh, with us discuss discussing what HHS is doing on climate change and health equity and what your office is doing. Uh, a special thanks to our audience for sending in such ex excellent questions. Um, and before we close, I just want to remind you that these, uh, these all the sessions will be posted to our website, which is actually on the bottom of John's slide right there. Um, so please jot that down. Um, and with and make sure you go to that web page to also sign up for our listserv to get a not notice when the um, sessions are posted. 
So thank you, everybody. Thank you, John. Everybody have an excellent uh, week celebrating Earth Day and have a great afternoon. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, everybody. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.